This is Doug Farquhar. I'm with the National Conference of State Legislatures. I want to thank you for joining us today for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Lead in the Water, Financing Options to Replacing Lead Service Lines. Today's, Today's webinar, webinar is being hosted, being hosted by, by NCSL. By NCSL. 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 For a schedule of upcoming webinars, please... The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you for joining us today at the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Lead in the Water, Financing Options to Replacing Lead Service Lines. Today's webinar is being hosted by NCSL. For a schedule of upcoming webinars, please visit www.ncsl.org. My name is Doug Farquhar, and I'm the Environmental Health Program Manager at NCSL, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. To begin the, the webinar, we're going to start with a couple of poll questions. Um, you should be able to see on your screen on how to vote and poll these following questions. But the first question for you is I want to ask everyone, is how many of you knew that lead in drinking water was the second most common pathway for childhood lead exposure? We're going to let people vote. We're starting to build up, starting to populate the poll now. It looks like 78% uh, knew that, 80% knew that there was a problem with, uh, with lead in drinking water. So it sounds like people are fairly common about that. For the next poll, I'm going to ask a separate question. How many of you know if you have lead service lines in your home or if in, you have them in your community? With that, the poll should pop open again. And with that, it looks like about 60% of you have some idea uh, that you had lead service lines in your community. Uh, and only 17% uh, uh, are not aware of any lead service lines. So it sounds like lead service lines are a major issue out there in the community. Today's presenters will discuss how states are funding the replacement of lead service lines. Before I begin, I'd like to mention that this webinar is being recorded and the residents will be able to access a recording of the webinar and presentation slides on the NCSL website. We'll send out a notice after the webinar to link to these resources. Our speakers today include Senator Robert Coles from Wisconsin, Representative Jeremy Thiesfeld, he is also from Wisconsin. Tom Neltner will follow by speaking from the Environmental Defense Fund. And our final speaker today will be Steve Villa, Director of Federal Relations, American Waterworks Associations. Our presenters will be answering questions after their presentations. Please be willing to type in your questions in the question box on the right side of your screen anytime during the webinar, and we will ask them um, following the, each one session. To begin with, we are going to have the Senator Coles and also Representative Thiesfeld speak about recent legislation that they have introduced in the state of Wisconsin. With that, I'm turning the floor over to Senator Coles. Senator? Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for having uh, Jeremy and myself on. Uh, we've made some progress with the bill to give local governments uh, a tool to go after lead service lines in Wisconsin. Uh, the mains can be cleaned up using water utility money, but the laterals cannot be. So with the Flint situation and the, the surge of publicity that occurred, I mean, Jeremy and I were aware that there was a problem, but with all that publicity around Flint, we looked at Wisconsin and we found that uh, we have an estimated 175,000 lines uh, lead, lead service lines, and we were looking for a way to do this. So we were convinced that, that this was a health problem, but all that publicity 
boosted it to the point where we could move forward with a piece of legislation. So I, you know, we believe that that uh, the science is there, that there's no question it's damaging to our health, especially for kids. So that was a major selling point, the, the damage to kids' health. So we drafted this legislation that would uh, move the authority move the authority to the local governments, water utilities, city councils, where they would have to pass pass a resolution uh, to move forward. Uh, do you want to move forward on the slides? I think we could move past slide two and into slide three. Okay. Current lead abatement practices. Currently, uh, many of my, our, our utilities are using what's called corrosion inhibitors. That costs money to try to ameliorate the problem of lead in service lines. We also have some EPA monies that are being distributed through our through our own DNRs, but it's it's a pittance compared to the overall problem. It was roughly, I think, 11 million in the last fiscal year. So we needed to come up with something that would give local governments the authority, and that's what this bill does. It uh, it allows a given community, if they so choose, to pass an ordinance, to put an increment on, and then that would be sent off to the Public Service Commission for their approval or disapproval. So I believe we're over on page five now, function of the Leading on Lead Act. You still there? Yeah, we're there. Do you see page five up? Function of, of the Leading on Lead Act. Yeah, I don't it's see it on mine, but hopefully all the participants see it. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's, go ahead. So, you know, basically, you know, we were convinced that this was a, a health problem. And over, you know, the history of this country, there have been health problems that have been dealt with by legislatures at, at either the local or state level. So having been convinced that this was a health problem, we created this method to give local governments the ability to wipe these lead laterals out. And that's where we're at at the moment. Jeremy, do you want to throw some things in here? Uh, just keep going. You're doing just fine. I, I've, I'll, I, my notes are to follow up on yours, so I, I'll, I'll wait till you're finished. Well, the benefits of all this, I mean, it's local control. They would be able to use 50% uh, 50 grants or loans, and this would help communities back off of uh, the various corrosion inhibitors that they have. Um, we're not imposing this on local governments. If a local government feels that they want to do it, they have to pass the resolution and get it approved by the PSC. So that's basically it. Would you like us to advance on to the, the next slide there? Yes, I think you should, yes. And so this, uh, this bill will not uh, affect, it, it has no impact on the state budget. That's correct, it's, it's, it would be water bills. So the the ratepayers would end up paying the uh, the cost of the of the activity, right? Or the right. replacement? Is that That's correct? That's right. That's correct. Now, some water utilities may have funds that have been building up. They're currently prohibited from using those funds. This legislation would now let them use those funds if they so choose, uh, and they could pass the resolution. So. We're opening up options for local government. Now, some may want, might, might want to, they might just say, no, we're not doing it. Others may say, we want to do this pretty aggressively and then want to push the Public Service Commission to have, you know, a larger increase on the water bills than would otherwise be there. But they could start as small as they want and they could come up with, let's say, a five year plan to get rid of everything, or maybe it's longer. But with the lack of cash available in our state treasury, you know, we felt this was the only way to, to move this forward. You know, in theory, you, the state could have come up with a bunch of money 
and just paid for all these lead laterals. But that was not realistic. So this way, you're pushing it back to the local governments. They decide to to help with the health of individuals in those communities and also increase the housing stock. I'd point out that uh, having the realtors behind the legislation and characterizing the current situation as toxic was very helpful in getting votes in the Republican legislature. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to hear. Um, Rep uh, uh, if it's okay, I'd like to move on to Representative Thies Thiesfeld. Um, just real quick, uh, Representative, you, this is your first fourth term as a legislator. You you uh, serve at the Fond du Lac City Council, and you're a former school teacher and public school administrator for 21 years. Is that correct? Uh, all of that's correct except for the last one. I was not public school. It was always private schools. So, you know, digging into lead laterals is kind of a new avenue for me. I spend most of my time in the legislature dealing with education-related issues. I'm chair of the Assembly Education Committee. So this was kind of fun, and it, it kind of took me back to my city council days where we did have to deal with things such as this. So that experience was important in my, my process of going through this. Uh, so would you like me to go ahead with some comments then? Yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the The importance of this bill is pretty clear. I mean, Bob talked about how um, we have a lot of these in, these sorts of um, houses in Fond du Lac. And, of course, what we're talking about is the pipe in your municipality that goes from the house to the sidewalk for the most part. And it is 100% the property owner's pipe. Uh, the community has no ownership of that. It, it hooks up to the municipal water supply in somewhere underneath the sidewalk, uh, which then extends out into the street. And you know, Bob's interest in this bill, as well as mine, is that both of us represent two of the largest, well, not largest, but oldest cities in uh, the state of Wisconsin. Green Bay was where the European settlers first stepped out onto the shore uh, and Fond du Lac uh, was uh, not too far behind that. And so we have a lot of lead laterals throughout our community. In my, in my community of about 45,000, they're estimating that we have about 10% of the homes have lead laterals yet. Uh, and you, know, you look at the problems in our communities, it's even larger in, in Milwaukee, obviously, and I discovered through the process of studying this that in Milwaukee, there actually was a period of time where the city required any new houses that were built and hooked up to the municipal water system that they had to use lead pipes. Uh, and many of those are very likely still in place. Uh, so that, that gives you an idea of the importance of the bill because, you know, there are a lot of things that Republicans and Democrats disagree on, but one thing we do agree on is that lead is bad and it has ultimately poor, um, it ultimately has very bad impacts on particularly children. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to have long-term costs in terms of education because you have uh, children who ingest this and it affects their IQ and their ability to learn, uh, as well as any associated health costs that there are going to be with that. So it's it's clearly a problem. The difficulty was how are you going to pay for it? And uh, it, it does not do any good for your community to replace their own lead laterals without replacing also the ones that lead up to the house. Uh, because the studies show that when you replace one part of the pipe, disturbing the pipe releases a whole bunch more lead into the water. And so you, you need to really replace both of them at the same time. Um, the other factor in this, which I don't know how we deal with that, is, is that there are still many people out there, even after you replace all of this, there are still many people out there who have very old fixtures in their house. Uh, they're their internal piping, their um, their faucets, and so forth that have lead parts in them, uh, and so that's still a problem that needs to be taken care of. So there there are a lot of challenges that we had to overcome in this process, um, and what we 
tried to do was we have we have the public service commission or the PSC which kind of is our oversight agency over utilities in the state and we wanted to make sure we protected their rules that they operate by uh, as well as make sure that we protected the consumers as well as our partners uh, that there are in our communities in the water utilities we wanted to also be fair with um, particularly businesses, large businesses who have maybe made some of these changes already. And because some of this would be solved through raising utility rates, uh, that it was respected the fact that they did it on their own already. Uh, and now are having to contribute possibly in a small way towards everybody else uh, fixing the problem as well. Uh, we also wanted to give the communities some flexibility because they have their own internal programs possibly that they maybe have begun already uh, and we didn't really want to impact those programs too much uh, and we wanted them to be able to have some sort of you know they some of them have unique ways of dealing with this and we didn't want to get in the way of that um, it, we also wanted the homeowners to have a significant stake in the process uh, i i think it's it's obvious that if you know, if, if you're going to provide them with 100% of the cost to fix this problem, you know, there's no, there's no barrier to them in going out and finding the highest cost replacement that they can if they're going to perhaps hire their own people to do it, which many communities allow that as an option to have somebody come in and do it for you. Uh, if you give them a make sure that they have a stake in the game such as 50% of the cost They're going to do the best that they can to try to keep that cost down uh, There there also was plenty of skepticism out there on the part of a number of individuals uh, the I'm from the assembly side or as many other states call it the house side uh, and Bob Coles is on the Senate side and as it went through the committee process in the state assembly uh, it was one of, one of the more contentious uh, committee votes that I can recall in my eight years in the legislature uh, where you had Republicans because you know, raising water rates is not really a Republican -y sort of thing to do uh, and I, I think that we had probably a six-month delay between when it passed in the committee before it actually passed on the floor and that probably was good to have that delay because I think it gave some of these legislators a chance to think it through and uh, perhaps study what's going on in their own communities to find out if how serious a problem this is um, I, I in, in kind of a funny sort of way I talked about skepticism uh, I can use an example of a kind of a different situation going back you know years ago in our in our community and many communities across the country if you probably recall we had to replace all kinds of elm trees well in my community in Fond du Lac we replaced all kinds of elm trees with ash trees and now we have this new insect called the emerald ash borer and now we're replacing all of these ash trees and so we had a lot of people skeptical that said you know we're replacing these with PVC pipes. What are we going to find out about PVC pipes down the road that causes us to have to replace all of them and replace it with something else? Uh, so you know, there's that kind of skepticism out there. Um, but I, I found it was mostly a battle between our our rural communities where they don't have they aren't hooked up to municipal water systems uh, and they weren't really interested in paying for it. Uh, so them against our urban communities that have the water utilities and then you had suburban communities who are not as old as some of our urban communities and maybe don't have many lead laterals and they wanted to make sure that their members of their community weren't subsidizing the urban communities because a lot of them actually share water systems uh, so all of those challenges were there uh, and it was it's fair and like I said it's not a it's not law yet but it appears to be headed that direction and it's just been it's been very gratifying to work with Senator Coles and that we've been able to come to a consensus as we've gone along here that sounds very good that was a fascinating overview uh, we do have a question here uh, it is for Senator Coles Senator um, how do you 
view this as a as a conservative or Republican approach to dealing with a substantial uh, public health problem. Um, were, were there approaches that uh, were considered and not gone forward with, or was this basically the the best approach you came came up with? This was the best approach, and. For, the, for those that would say, why should a Republican that's you know cautious on spending money uh, do this? Uh, back up in time, uh, if you get, we had the Clean Water Act back in the 60s or 70s, there were people that had clean water that were more affluent, but there was a decision made because it was a public health issue, you know, to make it more widespread. Same with garbage collection. Same with a, a number of environmental issues that may have affected segments of the population, but not affected uh, more affluent. So the question is, do we address a public health problem uh, in a way that, in, in, in a way that uh, allows all these, these families, you know, typically young families that are living in these older homes in inner cities to have a chance to not contaminate their kids, especially. So th this was, it, I look at this as a public health problem, and Republicans have been active, just like Democrats, over time, over the last hundred or so years, in dealing with various types of public health problems. That's yeah, and that's a very good response. And one of the things I I often I often note is that uh, if you have a public health problem, it doesn't matter which party you are, you have to you have to address it. Another question came in uh, it, Doug, asking. Doug, could I chime in yes, on sir. that one too? Yeah, I, I think that particularly now we have this movement away from uh, rural living to sub, uh, suburban, well, even not even suburban, it's more urban living. Uh, the millennials, a lot of the young people, they really don't have much interest in living out in rural areas. And whenever you're gonna live in a community of some sort and you're living in close quarters, there are some things that are going to have to be decided together. You know, if, if, you, if you don't wanna to have to deal with uh, these sorts of issues where you have water utilities and so forth, um, you, you may be best served uh, living outside of rural or living outside of urban areas uh, where you kind of have everything that isn't connected to other people's stuff. Uh, so there has to be some a practical approach to that sort of thing too. That if you're we're going to continue to live in in urban areas, we have to share in some of these responsibilities. Uh, a question came in asking, how much do you expect rates to increase? Uh, is this going to be a substantial water rate increase, or is it going to be fairly minimal? I would say it would be very minimal. Now, as I mentioned. A number of these water utilities have some reserves set aside, but they're under current law. They cannot use them for personal lead laterals. So they could they could ask for permission to do that and really quickly. But look, for example, if there was an unreasonable increase, the Public Service Commission can say, no, we're not going to give you that 10% increase. Try a much smaller increase. And I, that's the way I see this being tempered. But remember, Local officials have to vote on it. So it's not just Jeremy and I acting in Madison. It's the local officials that say, okay, we believe that in our community, whatever community, whether it's a huge community like Milwaukee or a much smaller community in Shawano, or it could be Fond du Lac, could be, any old community probably has the lead laterals. They're gonna have to make a decision as those elected officials to make, to address the public health issue and increase the value of, of, the, of, that, of those structures. Because when you find out that there's lead laterals, the value of the home is diminished. Gotcha, and so the opposite would be true that once you have it replaced, the value of the home will increase. We, we, we believe so. Um, and I got one more question here, and it's probably for Representative Thiesfeld. It has to do with rural. Um, Folks that are on uh, private well water systems, would they be able to access this funding at all, or would this be uh, strictly limited to uh, public service lines? I'm not sure I have the exact answer to that. My initial feeling would be is that no, because we're we're talking about municipal 
water supplies. We're talking about water utilities, and that wouldn't apply to the rural areas. And Bob, do you have any further comment? On no, that? I would agree with that. I mean that. I mean, as, as Jeremy pointed out before, this bill does not deal with you know bad lead pipes that are inside the home. We're dealing just dealing from the main at the curb into the to the edge of the home. So inside the home, that's still a dilemma. But right, various, that would individuals be probably have, take various individuals have pointed out that you know that it's critical to get these lead laterals uh, removed because, especially when they fix the mains, uh, a lot of communities have fixed their mains. If you don't if you don't fix the lead lateral, there's a parent, some chemical uh, procedure that causes a surge of lead in the water to come into the into the given home. That sounds good. Well, with that, I'm going to say thank you to both of you for your time today. We're going to please stay on because we may have a few more questions at the end. Sure. But but I'd like to turn over to our next speaker, Tom Neltner with the Environmental Defense Fund in Washington, D.C. Tom is the chemical policy director. He leads efforts to remove or minimize hazardous chemicals from products in the marketplace through cross-cutting policy initiatives. Tom's primary focus is on food additive safety and reducing lead in our homes and communities. He's a chemical engineer and attorney with experience in chemical safety issues in the workplace, the environment, the home, consumer products, and food. Tom serves on EPA's Children's Health Protection Advisory Committee and has played a leading role in an EPA-convened multi-stakeholder work group that makes recommendations to the agency to upgrade its lead in drinking water regulations. Tom, we'd like to welcome you to the webinar. Thank you, Doug. And, and thanks to the Senator and the Representative for their work on this legislation. You've almost got it done, but it's clear that that time, that investment of talking it through with your colleagues made a difference as you refined it, addressed their concerns. It's that kind of persistence and thoughtfulness that makes a difference. Um, from Environmental Defense Fund's perspective, we really like to see states empowering communities to make their own decisions. And Wisconsin's been a leader in this area, so uh, nice work. Uh, I know it wasn't easy. It sounds like some of those uh, hearings got a little, um, a little contentious, but uh, I appreciate your persistence. You're welcome. So uh, what I want to do is talk about what other states are doing to provide some context. Obviously, you've just heard about Wisconsin. I'll cover some of the other things Wisconsin's doing, but I wanted to just spend a few minutes going over sort of how they approach it. Um, so the central challenge, I think the Senator and Representative queued it up nicely, is how do you deal with replacing lead service lines on private property where those that replacement could be considered an improvement to the property. From my perspective, it's clearly an improvement to the property. It also, because it reduces the public health threat, and it's more efficient than doing it in parts. So it's, it's a good change. The problem is states, and Wisconsin is among those, prohibit utilities from using the rate money to buy, paid by customers to pay for improvements on private property. They, and that meant you couldn't use grant money, you couldn't lose loan money, you couldn't use labor. Now we'll talk about Wisconsin it does provide grant money, but it's federal grant money. It's not state rate money to do it. And the bottom line is that without that kind of support, without allowing local communities to you choose to use that money to support it, a lot of homeowners wouldn't replace it, especially those without the resources. Um, it may only go to those with the money, and frankly, when it comes to lead poisoning, we're, all, we're worried mostly about the children on the low-income side that are already, um, already overexposed to the lead. So we can go to the next slide. Um, there are three basic approaches that we see in the states. One is the one we just talked about in Wisconsin, which is allowing the rates paid by the customers to subsidize that replacement. It doesn't have to subsidize all of it. Your, Wisconsin's not forcing any community to do it. It's only setting limits on how it does it. The other one is forgivable loans from the state revolving loan fund. That's the federally financed program. And by making 
get forgivable loans, it works out to be a bit like a grant. The other one is just straight up using grant money out of something other than the state revolving loan fund. Now, the second one is doesn't require legislative approval, but having legislators support it makes a difference as administrators of the fund are making decisions. It's about setting priorities. And fundamentally, the rationale to do it is to protect the public health from lead, especially by avoiding doing partial lead service on replacement. It's the old adage of when you do a halfway job, it can make it worse. And when it comes to lead, doing a halfway job, replacing only the portion on the public side makes it worse, especially in the short, short term. The other one is cost effectiveness. It doesn't make sense to do, when you do half the job and then you have to go back in and do the other half, it's not, it costs more money. Ultimately, think in 20 years, there's no way we should be drinking water through a lead pipe. So the goal is to avoid that. So let's go over the rates and see what other states are doing outside of the Wisconsin example. So the first one is Indiana. Um, this, is, this is my home state, so I'm partial to it. And what they did in April 2017 is they unanimously passed House Enrolled Act 1519. Um, it was also a Republican, a home builder, that proposed doing that in a rural area. Um, and what he proposed and was passed by partisan support um, was to allow the Utility Commission to approve proposals to fold that cost of lead service line replacement into the rates paid by the customers. Now, unlike Wisconsin, which puts restrictions on it, um, how much could be grants, how much could be loans, what Indiana did is said, you have to answer 10 criteria, and then the U Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission will approve it. So it left it more open, but that's but I think it'll end up being, look, the actual proposals will look a lot more like what was ended up in, which we hope will end up in Wisconsin. There are no proposals yet for pending. It was done in April and it takes time to develop these proposals. I'm anticipating one coming in in April, or I'm sorry, in January, or January maybe even December to, uh, to do with it. It takes time to work their way through the process. There will be a whole public process for this. Now, there is one difference between Wisconsin and Indiana. In Indiana, you only have to go through the Utility Regulatory Commission if you're a private utility. The municipal-owned utilities don't have to go through that Utility Regulatory Commission. And that's a similar approach in Pennsylvania, where only the privates need to go through it. But they just passed. It was signed I, on the governor by on Halloween, um, October 31st, and that was House Enrolled Act 674. But I encourage you to be patient as you download it and look at it. It's on page 43 because it's a, a financing bill. So it dealt with many other issues. And what it does is allow municipal authorities to protect public health by replacing private water laterals. It gives, so whereas Indiana was focused on the private side because the publics had the authority, in Pennsylvania it was focused on the public side because that was where a lot of the requests were coming from. And in Pennsylvania, the Utility Regulatory Commission had already taken that kind of action. So what they said is, if a municipality determines that it's public, if necessary to protect public health, they can use rates to replace it on private side. They can use that public funds and they can use their employees. So it's a little variation because states are different in this area. And we were hoping in Wisconsin it'll pass right away and we'll be able to add more details on it, but you already heard that from the Senator and the representative. So let's look at the next mechanism on the next slide. So this one is forgivable loans from the SRF. So in this case, I think you went too far. If you could back up one. If you could back up one here, please. Tom, you want us to go back one? Yes, go back one, please. There so, you go. Did you say Virginia? Good. 
The reason is the senator and representative would never for, would never forgive me if I skipped past Wisconsin. <laughs> so Wisconsin took the money from the state revolving loan fund, and they said we're going to under authority given by EPA and the state to administer it, that we're going to set aside $25 million over two years to help disadvantaged municipalities, that's the word they use, to give them grants, principal forgiveness works like a grant, to replace flood service lines. And that has led to a lot of communities, including Green Bay, to be a leader on the issue, Fond du Lac grant, and that's helping to reduce the burden on those low-income communities um, and to reduce the burden on the rates because in communities without a lot of extra resources, sometimes that help from the state makes a difference. So we're glad to see Wisconsin do it. Wisconsin was the first. They did it in 2016. Virginia looked at that model and followed their lead and offered $2.5 million. And what they were doing is a slightly different mechanism they said, we'll do $5,000 per service line, and that includes a $500 administrative fee, and they offered this as part of the regular package to utilities. So Wisconsin and Virginia, and then we had two others. That's the next slide. New Jersey did it, and they set aside $30 million, and it goes to public and nonprofit utilities, not private, and it's for communities that where the community in the county is low income in context to the rest of the county. So less than, if, they have, if their median household income is less than the median household income of the county, they were eligible. Um, we understand about three or four communities were eligible for this. It's not a total forgiveness, it's 10% interest-free loans. Um, and that creates some problems, I think, in how they are administering it. We're still trying to get details on it. But they put $30 million up because they have 350,000 lead service lines, is the estimate. Vermont, which in contrast has much fewer, uh, 7,400, they offered $110,000 in grant money through the SRF and actually found more money. And they, I think they're offering, they ended up providing 125000 and their approach was slightly different. They said, we're looking for community water systems that are going to serve as a model. So they were really focused on how can we make this work in other communities and really thinking of it as seed money. So those are the four that are taking this approach of using SRF money. It's administrative, but I do think it doesn't work without legislators saying, we want to find ways to solve this problem. The third approach is grants, so the next slide covers that. And in New York, they, through general revenues, offered $20 million in grants and said, we want it allocated equitably among the regions of the state because like most states, it's diverse and you know the upstate wants to make sure that the western part doesn't get it or the, or the New York City doesn't grab it all. So it had to be allocated equitably and they prioritized municipalities with high rates of elevated blood lead levels. Now, drinking water is only one of the sources. So what you're doing is prioritizing communities that are already struggling with and have documented lead, lead challenges among children. And, the, and they set two additional considerations to the state. One is, do they have a lot of lead service lines? And second is, is the community low income? So they provided a bunch of factors that is just getting started. So they're moving forward, but it's different because it took legislative approval because it was actually part of the budget bill. It was a proposal from the governor, it was embraced by the legislature, and it went through largely without changes from what I can tell in the process. So those are the three main areas that you could do to make this happen. I wanted to just highlight some resources next. So if you could go to the next slide. So, you know, this, this happens not in isolation. One thing that has is, is happened is the three trade associations, including Steve Vias, the one he works for, the American Water Works Association, who has been a leader on this area, um, have collaborated together and joined with 25 other national organizations ranging from housing organizations 
to the National League of Cities, to public health, to environmental organizations like Environmental Defense Fund and Natural Resources Defense Fund, the three utilities, Children's Health, 25 organizations that all got together and are advocating for ways, or not advocating, but trying to help support communities through what's called the Lead Service Line Replacement Collaborative. It's not an advocacy organization, but what they posted is a toolbox to help communities States can do it, use it too, anybody can use it, but it's for those communities to sort of get started and develop a roadmap. Think about what policies are needed and then look at the replacement practices themselves. I have to push our blog and our website. So we have a website that provides more details. We actually track all the communities and all the states that are making progress. And then when the senator and the representative get that bill signed, we'll add Wisconsin's to it. And we also do a blog where we track a lot of these activities that you can sign up for. So that's the quick rundown of what states are doing. Um, we're looking forward to adding Wisconsin to the list, and we're thinking that there's going to be other states as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was very informative. Our final speaker today is Steve Villa from the American Water Works Association. Steve is the Director of Federal Relations for AWWA, and it works with federal agencies on the development of policy and regulations that affect the water sector. Communicating federal policy and regulations and communicating federal policy and regulations to the water sector. Steve has 31 years of professional experience in environmental regulatory compliance assistance related to state and federal drinking water, wastewater, and solid waste regulations. His work includes supporting communities engaged in the planning, financing, and managing of infrastructure improvements. Please join me in, thank in welcoming Steve Villa to the webinar. Steve? I'm sorry, Steve, we're not hearing you. Are you on the line? I am. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to speak with you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with you about financing lead service line replacement. It's a, it's a very important topic for the water sector and, and for communities across the U.S. Um, here I am coming at the end of, of several speakers, so I'm going to be talking about some some background material that that wasn't covered by the others uh, so much. I think that the uh, the senator and the representative, their presentation was great in that it it not only presented their path forward for Wisconsin, but it also got into a lot of the the issues that are going to be raised in every community or every state that takes on this topic and and that give and take uh, and discussion around those issues is is a uh, as they described, sometimes can be painful, but but that's what it takes to to move the topic forward. So if you'd move to the to the first slide, when when you're thinking about the water sector and you're thinking about lead service lines, it's important to think about where they are. Um, and so first off, where they are is in primarily community water systems. Uh, it doesn't mean that you might not have them with private wells. Uh, or homes with private or businesses with private wells, but when when you hear our sector talk about lead service lines, it's normally in the frame of of a uh, a distribution system that's uh, serving a community. In the United States, there are about 51,000 community water systems. It could be anything from a a mobile home court to New York City, Los Angeles. Uh, thousands upon thousands of people. And there are communities of all sizes that have lead service lines. Some of them are urban and some of them are, are rural. And when you find lead service lines, it, it's not going to be determined by one of those or the other. It's really going to be determined by when the structures were built in that community. So you're looking for homes from the late uh, 1800s into the mid-1900s, 
perhaps as late as into the 70s, uh, 1970s, but primarily the earlier 19th century. And as a function of that community um, and, the, and the environment they're in, the cost of that lead service line could vary, and replacing it could vary anywhere from $1,200, $1,300 to, to reaching $10,000 or more for the entire lead service line replacement. Remembering that you're replacing a line that's running uh, both underneath the street to reach the main and underneath the personal property, which now 100 years later could very well have a porch built on top of it, be underneath a, a beautiful wall that's been there for 50 years, uh, be underneath the family's oak tree. Um, so the, the cost of replacement is, is very site specific. We tend to use something like uh, $5,600 as a just a rule of thumb to multiply through by. Could we go on to the next slide? The other thing to keep in mind is that when you're when you're talking about paying for infrastructure, water infrastructure in the United States, replacement of infrastructure, new infrastructure is primarily being paid for by water rates and charges. Even if you get a loan, the repayment of that loan, the repayment of the interest is being covered through rates and charges to customers. Um, right now, the majority of lead service line replacement that's occurring is being done on sort of a pay-go basis. The, the, the ongoing budget of the, of the utility and the community uh, uh, in the course of, of uh, main replacement. And um, the, the scenario that was described earlier, um, several of them, um, really rely on integrating full lead service line replacement into ongoing distribution system replacement and 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 incorporating the full full replacement of the lead service line. Tom's already went through uh, the state and federal programs that are we typically think of when funding uh, replacements in the in the sector or infrastructure in general. Uh, the first uh, program is the Safe Drinking Water Act revolving loan funds. Uh, Rural utility service underneath uh, USDA become would be your second. Uh, many communities uh, can can tap into the CDBG program, and we have a new program called uh, WIFIA, the Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, that's just coming to the fore now, just beginning to implement. That's going to be a, an opportunity, as well as the states state funds or bonds that, that Tom described. So let me go into the next slide. Um, when we look at lead service lines, I mentioned earlier that they tend to be found uh, during a particular date range for construction. Uh, they actually tended to be placed in more affluent uh, communities uh, in that date range. And so they're not evenly distributed across the U.S. And so this map is, a, is an estimate based on some survey data that uh, David Cornwell and, and uh, colleagues put together. But you can see that in the upper Midwest uh, and the East Coast, we're going to see more lead service lines. And then you can watch the, the country expand out to the, to the West and the, and the more recent structures out in the West don't, don't have it. Uh, you might also hear that uh, in your community, there's, there's galvanized pipes and we don't have lead service lines. So you don't, there are varieties of, of components in a water system. When we talk about the lead service line uh, as a part of the lead service line replacement collaborative, we're talking about a service line where any component of that line uh, has lead. And back during the period when lead service lines were installed, you would find that it was lead was the most readily of malleable of the uh, metals that were available, and so when you needed a uh, a curve, you might might use lead, and so we have a a lead piece that connects lead service lines to mains, 
that's called a gooseneck. And in some communities where there's galvanized pipe, you might also find that lead gooseneck. It's a much shorter length, typically something like two foot, as opposed to the full 40 or 60 that you'd see otherwise with a lead, full lead service line. But still, it's it's another piece of lead that's that's out there in the in the distribution system. Uh, going to the next slide. Coming back again to the federal programs, I just wanted to give you a feel for the nature of those programs. Uh, the 2017 funding levels are there on the first line. Uh, three of the programs are loan programs. Uh, and so there's a bit of an interest rate associated with each, uh, typically below market. Uh, all of them are administered by a federal agency, but typically they're done in collaboration with the state. So the SRF and Community Development Block Grant are really run through the states, and there is a collaboration to some degree with the state on, on with you. All of these programs are subject to federal cross -cut cutters like Davis-Bacon for wages. And again, if you're looking at smaller communities, some of those cross cutters can, can be more challenging, like Davis-Bacon, where local uh, actually meeting Davis-Bacon in a rural community may be more challenging. Each one of those programs also has a defined purpose underneath its respective act, and so there is targeting. So each of those funds is not equally available to every community. Next slide. So Tom ran through a series of uh, case studies where there have been programs put in place. They've actually been there, done that. Uh, this is a presentation where a colleague of ours in uh, who happens to work for Arcadis, uh, Rebecca Slaybaugh, she's she's out prospectively. Yes? Uh, she's out there prospectively looking for options for utilities to work with customers to fund lead service line replacement programs. And she's identified uh, not only the ones that Tom described and, and I've laid out, but also uh, the notion of local mini bonds, uh, local lending programs, if you go on to the next slide. Uh, looking at MSBUs or private foundations and tapping into non-rate revenue. Uh, for example, one of our, one case study you often hear about is Ann Arbor, Michigan, I'm sorry, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they replaced lead service lines a, a number of years ago and they funded it uh, by tapping into the, the revenue stream coming from renting antennas on tanks, uh, as opposed to uh, general fund or, or rate revenues. Uh, we've already talked about rate increases, and in some, in some states, it'd be possible to do special uh, tax assessments or uh, through a special district, come up with a, an assessment. Uh, but Again, in the, with the notion of coming up with local solutions or state-based state solutions that, that meet individual state needs, uh, there are a number of other uh, approaches that can still be explored. Uh, next slide. And I just wanted to, to close out uh, reminding you of pretty much of the same points that Tom, Tom made, laid out in his examples. Uh, a lot of the activity right now that's occurring is a, basically a shared cost approach uh, at either point of sale for houses or uh, at utility construction, where we're working with individual homeowners to replace lead service lines, oftentimes with the customer bearing a large portion of that, that cost burden. Uh, we've seen some examples of dedicated state funds uh, with or without involvement of the SRF, and we've seen some use of local state funds that's non-rate revenue. And we are right now with the work like that in, in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Pennsylvania, transitioning into the direct application of utility water rate funds. But those funds are also what pay for all of the other uh, lead service, um, all of the other infrastructure replacement that's being done in the community. And and uh, Doug, that was that was where I was going to close. If if there were any questions. Great, thank you very much, Steve. That was very informative. 
We do have a few final questions here before we wrap up, but I would like to uh, remind everybody that if you do have questions, please type them in in the question box in the corner of your uh, in the corner box on the webinar. Um, Tom, there is a question that did come in. It was regarding New York. Uh, who administers this program? Does the money go directly to the uh, to the public utilities, or is it administered at the state level? It's administered at the state level. The New York Department of Environmental Conservation manages it. Thank you. Um, and then one other question that did pop in uh, came in to uh, regarding the lead service. I'm sorry, the uh, state revolving funds. And I guess it's a question either for Steve or for Tom. Uh, state revolving funds, uh, are they allowed to use that money for lead service lines? Uh, yes, they are. They are. The, uh, it's going to depend on uh, a couple of factors. Uh, the states have their own funds that they've put into the SRF. Uh, those funds are only subject to the restrictions that that state puts on on the funds as opposed to any federal restrictions. Uh, a number of state SRFs do not allow the, uh, the recipient of the funds to, to invest in an asset that they don't maintain for the life of the asset or at least the life of the loan. And so in those instances, the state may need to be more explicit in its policy or treatment of service lines or uh, another workaround may be needed. And then there have been the examples like you've seen from, from Virginia uh, where the SRF funds are, are being used. Great. Well, thank you very much. I want to put a thank you out there for all our speakers today um, for giving us their time this afternoon and talking about financing uh, the replacement of lead service lines. With that, this is Doug Farquhar, and on behalf of the National Conference of State Legislatures, I want to say thank you and have a great afternoon.